Hello, ladies, and welcome to Real Life Conversations. I'm Dr. Vanessa Ellen, and I am so excited to be back with you again tonight. And as I always tell you, we have another amazing guest with us on tonight. Mrs. Janie Street will be joining us as we jump into our conversation tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the pitfalls of the disappointed wife and how to handle his sin issues. I meant to pull out a book um, that I'd gotten years ago. I think it's called um, When His Sin Breaks Your Heart or something like that. And I forgot to pull it out, but it's a good resource. But grab your coffee, grab your tea. Most of all, grab your Bible and join me because I want to lay a foundation before we get started and uh, just kind of chat with our guests. So if you have opportunity, turn over to Romans chapter 12. Let's just walk through that because that's going to be very foundational for our conversation tonight. Let's jump right in, okay? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Verse four, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function. So we are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Verse six, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And verse nine, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. We'll park right there until we get started and we'll pick up some of some of these other verses, I believe, as we get through our conversation. But before we do that, let me jump right in. Welcome, Mrs. Janie Street. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm so excited to have you back on the show. I know the ladies were blessed the last time you were here and so many of them were excited to see you come back. Oh, thank you. Well, I want to jump in and I think that let's start with I guess the question could be, is there a difference between sin and prayer? What do you think? Well, yeah, I definitely think so. Now, uh, some things might not be super clear, but I, I came up with a few little illustrations of what might be preference issues, but that we often sometimes get annoyed at as a wife. Okay. So yeah. one of them would be like uh, on the drive to church, if he takes the freeway rather than the side streets, like you'd rather do, or if he picks up the grocery store groceries from one store rather than another, or yes. if he waits till the car is almost on fumes before he fills it up and you like a little more security of uh, filling yeah. it up <laughs> on a quarter of a tank, those kind of things definitely would be in the area of preference issues. Yes, so, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I always say, if he feels the toilet paper should go this way and you think it should go that way, that's definitely a preference. Exactly. I, I sometimes um, define it for women by saying, you know, there's God's standard and then there's our standard, right? And there's nothing wrong with preferences per se. The problem comes in when we begin to elevate our preferences above God's standard. And exactly. then, yes, and then we begin to treat people as if they have sinned because we have placed that preference of ours so high that the word of God is just way low. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that that's a challenge to, um, to women everywhere to allow the word of God to inform what our, our uh, preferences ought to be, not what our preferences ought to be, but what 
uh, where his word is in relationship to our preference. You need yeah. to be more word of God centered. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's probably the biggest thing we'll say tonight. Um, because even if it's not a preference and it e is a sin, a true sin, a biblical sin that we can put our finger on, I still think there's a governing board called the word of God that can get us through even that issue. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the assumption is uh, that we have to, to know is that our husbands are going to sin. We're yes. going to sin. You know, we're all yes. human. We're all living in the flesh, even though we've been, let's let's say the husband and wife are both Christians. Okay. Yes. Let's just make that assumption at the beginning, but we're both, we're both of us are still going to sin in different ways. And so that's not even a question, but I, I like to think about this way. If, if I feel like it's my role to bring up all of his sins to him, okay, we've already said they're not the preferences, but they're really the sins. I have to then be willing for him to bring up every single one of my sins to me too, because uh, if you think about Matthew 7, 12, which yeah. is the do unto others verse, you know, if you would have them, how you would, you know, treat them, how you would have them treat you, you right there. And then you have to be willing to be that kind of a, an open wife to open to what he would say. And I think most of us would say, I don't want him to do that. And then there would be constant conflict because we'd be constantly bringing up each other's sins. So that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> and I think sometimes the problem is uh, the verse we just read. I think we, verse three, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, because I think at times we might think this sin list is this long. And yes. you know, mine is like, <laughs> It's not that big. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> More highly than we should, right? Exactly. I know when I go on a, on a sin hunt, you know, in my life, and I'm even when I'm praying to the Lord, you know, sometimes I, I, I have a harder time coming up with my sins than I should. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> but it's, it is the way of human nature. We tend to be far more self-favoring than we are of someone else. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, you say, OK, well, then what do I do with it? I can see ladies saying, but he really did sin. What do I do? with that? Let's talk a little bit about the danger of disappointment with God's creation that then can be a temptation to be disappointed with the creator. Yes. Well, one of the things that came to my mind when I was thinking about that um, was that most disappointments result from what I would call unmet expectations. Yes. Okay. That's where the disappointments come from. I'm disappointed because I expected this, this, this. I expected mm -hmm. he would this, 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 or he would do mm -hmm. or say or whatever. Okay. So it comes from that. And I, I at that point, uh, I want to recommend a book, which I know you've heard of before and um, maybe even used. What did you expect? Yes. The book title is What Did You Expect by Paul Tripp. And it deals with those marriage problems where they are, um, the marriage problems have come about largely because of some unrealistic or unmet, maybe they're not realistic expectations. Maybe they're even biblical. I expect yeah. my husband to go to church or to pray or whatever, because he says he's a Christian. But if they're unmet, then how do you deal with those? And that's a great resource there. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think sometimes like when we do premarital counseling, we try to get them to set realistic expectations. You know, if you think he's making two dollars and ninety nine cents today and once you marry him, he's going to make one hundred and ninety nine dollars an hour. You know, come on, let's set some real expectations. And then sometimes when they're not realized, then it's a problem. Yes. Or. I feel like sometimes we're taught traditionally from our families what a man should be. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Or mm -hmm. let's say you have a good relationship with your father and he's a godly man. Oh. And then you marry someone who's 20, 25. He's not the 55-year-old that your dad is. He hasn't right. grown and matured in the Lord. Your expectation is, what? who did I marry? What's the matter with him? <laughs> You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and I bet if we were to ask our mom what our dad was like when he was 21, 22, 25, <laughs> she would say, just hold on, baby. Keep living. Keep living. <laughs> <laughs> just keep on keeping on with us, man. So, so. Yeah. And I think uh, oftentimes we look at God's creation, man, our husband, and we almost elevate them to the status of God. 
Like you can never fail me. You can never let me down. You can never disappoint me. But the reality is he's not God. That's right. right. That's right. And, 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 and try to relate to, I'm getting a lot of feedback here, but try to relate to God as a person. Because a lot of times God is a, um, a, a, a theological truth, but we don't have that personal. And when, I'm not saying we're not saved, but we don't recognize his personhood as yeah. somebody who is real in our life. And our husband seems much more real because he's right there, you know, in yeah. flesh and blood. So um, trying to make that connection with God, because a lot of people say, well, I, I don't want somebody that I can't see. Right. I know he's there because I believe his word, but we, but it, it really does come down to an issue of unbelief that yes. he really is there for us. He really is there with us. He really is helping us and that, and that kind of thing. So, yes. And I think when we start to realize that unbelief, we have to realize that we've started to worship something other than the true creator. Yes. You know what I mean, we've started to worship either the marriage, the concept of marriage. Yes. Or our ideals of what marriage would be, or right. even just we worshiped our husband, you know, the ground that he walked on. We were yeah. so in love with him that mm -hmm. we weren't loving God and loving him. Yes, exactly. You know, it becomes a problem. It becomes, I worship him so much. I need him to be everything I need him to be. I need him to be my God. So yes. I can't possibly love him the way God called me to love him. Right, exactly. And the, and the Lord doesn't want us to love anybody like we should love him, of course. Exactly. So, and so why wouldn't he allow trouble in the water? Because he said there should be no other gods before me. You've made your husband a god. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, but for the sincere Christian woman, okay, maybe she hasn't made her husband or god, but she's she's come upon, you know, the disappointments of life. You know, um, in in marriage, I, I think that some Christian women they focus way too much and they spend too much time thinking about the problems and the yeah. negative things that are going on. Um, and obviously, we don't want to deny, you know, that yeah. problems exist. But I think mm -hmm. that we have to grapple with what God calls us to do, and that is to give thanks in everything. Oh yes, okay? to give thanks in everything. So that's going to be part of the solution, I think, for some women that are caught up and disappointment um, yeah. with their husbands, and then maybe even disappointment with God. But I think that also I want to just encourage women to study out what it means to, to give thanks and everything, because mm -hmm. I think that sometimes people look at that in a very simplistic way, because I know I did for years. Well, if that if it means to give thanks and everything, that means God wants me to thank him for this, this problem that I'm having. Okay. Yeah. That this difficulty or this conflict that's not being resolved or whatever it is, I'm not sure that God wants us to necessarily thank him for the hard, uh, the, the sin that's going on or whatever. But I think he wants us to thank him for specific realities that are true in the midst yeah. of that problem. Um, right. Okay. And I think that we do that by something as simple as taking Psalm 23. And praying mm. through the psalm, okay? It's not a psalm on Thanksgiving per se, but it's a psalm on getting your perspective on the right thing. So, you know, you start out with verse one, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, he's the Lord. So I can thank the Lord that he's in control of this. And then the Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd because I belong to him. And he is a shepherd, which means he's going to look out after me. There's just you can see how that, that can really begin to build a spirit of thanksgiving uh, in your heart, even when you're going through difficult times. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? You know, that's that's one of the worst things you could walk through. Right. Um, and, and yet it's right there in the text. So so building, uh, saying, okay, I spent enough time being disappointed and I've got to get, get real with this. And how am I going to do that? And how am I going to begin to thank the Lord when it doesn't seem like I want to thank the Lord? And you just use the scripture and the scripture helps you. So, yes. yes. Yeah. You know, that brought to mind because um, you were talking about being thankful. And, and, you know, I think people do take that a little bit out of context that I should be. Oh, my house is burning down. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, yeah. you know that's not exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my husband's committing adultery. Praise the Lord. You know, no, no, no. 
<laughs> I don't think that's the way that we should behave. But what I think I get from what you're saying is James chapter one, where he's saying, consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials. I like the part when it says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces yes. endurance. Yes. So when I'm thanking God through my trials, what I'm thanking him for is, God, you are pruning me. You are shaping me. You are molding me, making me, you know, walk like, act like, think like you through these trials. Yes. And God doesn't want to leave us in an immature state that we're in. He knows that we're babies. When we start our Christian, we need to be growing. He intends for us not to stay that way. And so that's why we can be thankful that he's intervening with some trials to bring about that maturity. Yeah, so, that is so good. That is so good. Ladies, if you've just joined us, I'm talking with Mrs. J Street, and we are talking through the problems of the disappointed wife, how to handle his in issues. Um, Janie, you mentioned you have some feedback on your side. I don't hear it. Do you okay, hear that's mine? Fine, that's fine. No, Do you I hear mine? Fine. Okay. I think we can only hear our own feedback, maybe. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's good. That's good. Well, I want to go on a little bit and build on this. Um, we talked about the difference between true sin and preference issues. And we talked about the danger of disappointment with the creation leading to being disappointed with the creator. Now I want to talk a little bit about the delusion of earthly solutions to marital problems. Because sometimes we delude ourselves into thinking, well, if I just give him whatever he wants, he'll stop sinning. If I become a silent wife, he'll stop sinning. You know, if I go to church every time the doors, he'll stop sinning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When in reality, that's an issue between him and God if he really is a believer. Right, right. Yeah, and some yeah, of the, some the um, um, things that you things mentioned, that, you mentioned that, are that are radical, radical solutions are like suicide, yes, or harming ourselves or others, yeah. uh, and those are those are obviously pretty radical solutions. But it's amazing how quickly the human mind can jump to something like that as being a yeah. solution. And so um, I kind of rephrased your statement there a little bit. You said the dissolution of earthly solutions, and I'd like to say too. The, the illusion that earthly solutions are truly mm. solutions. That's an illusion. Wow. Earthly solutions, worldly solutions are not truly solutions. And I think that that's one thing that we have to, to help people with. Um, we have to help ourselves with that. That um, something like um, uh, manipulating, doing all yeah. the church things so that he will be right or or, you know, even contemplating suicide or divorce. Any yeah. worldly solution is not a true solution. That's an illusion. That's a lie, really, from Satan that that's, well, then what is the solution? And I, it's really interesting that you mentioned James 1, because that's what scripture, my my mind was drawn to mm. um, about that. And as you walk through, you know, starting at verse two and all the way to the end of the chapter, you see certain things about the Christian walk, about the difficulties in the Christian walk. You, uh, the one that you brought up, knowing that the testing of your faith yeah. produces endurance, perfecting your faith. Okay, that's true. Yeah. I mean, we want to say, get me out of this. I don't want to ever be in this kind of a thing, situation that's going on. But God says, that the testing of your faith is going to produce that endurance and the maturity of your faith. Yes. Um, yeah. He talks about asking God for wisdom, but you have to do so with faith. You can't just ask God for wisdom and then say, but it's got to be like, you know, what I want it to be um, or say, but, but God is going to actually teach you and you have to believe yes. his way. You know, that whole faith thing is like, okay, Lord, I'm going to ask you, but I don't really believe that you really have the answer because my answer sounds a lot better than yours. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> you know? right. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I just kind of went through James 1, and I don't want to take the time to go through the whole thing, but I was just seeing all kinds of, of illustrations that talk about what godly solutions are. You know, yeah. being, a doer, being a doer of the word, that's a huge you know, um, solution there. Um, so anyways, it, it's a great chapter to work through. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. And it's important. I think we should list a couple of the solutions because in my mind, I'm picturing the wife who is sick and tired and sick and tired. She's sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know, um, and she may not be thinking 
suicide. She may be thinking harming him or she may be thinking walking away from the kids, walking away from him. You know, yeah. there, there are so many ungodly ways to approach because one of the things I want to say, ladies, that we are not saying, we're not saying that the weight of this world is not weighty. Exactly. And we're not saying that the, the pains of this life aren't very, very painful. Um, but I think they have a purpose. Yes. And if we don't embrace that God is on the throne and that he is, do, he really is doing something in your life. He may not change your external situation. You know, as we always say, you think your husband is crazy, he might be crazy. God may never stop him from being crazy, but what is he doing in your life and your walk in your world? And you wouldn't want to do something foolish and then spend the rest of your life in jail. Yeah. You know? Or, or regretting it, yeah, regretting something that you did, yeah, yes. knowing that it didn't please God and it hurt other people. Yes, so. and you can't take it back. Yeah, exactly. You know, we yeah. had the lady here in Houston that murdered all five of her children. You can't take that back. Oh, that's right. That is so you know? Yep. So I would say reach out to someone. If it really is that tough, reach out to your pastor, your pastor's wife, go to a leader in the church, find a mature woman, find someone to share your trouble with. Yes. And then I do, I really do want to speak to the woman that might be considering self-harm. Yeah. You know, it could be, oh, it's easier just to take pills. Yeah. Or yeah. it's just easier. It could be that her self-harm is that she gets drunk every day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. Uh, because it's, like an it's an escape, you know, yeah. from kind of helps you not feel so bad about what's going on. Exactly. Trying to dull or numb the pain. I, I would encourage you to say, listen, the the best thing to do is to dive into God's word and see what is he trying to take you through or take you to. Um, and that's not the answer. And, and I always say, even if you close your eyes today, you got to wake up and see him tomorrow. So <laughs> <laughs> that's really true. That's it's really a temporary true. solution to an eternal situation. Exactly. And don't women of faith um, uh, often pray about these things. And then when things don't change, they yeah. say, like we all would, God's not doing anything. God's yeah. not listening. I mean, he says he listens to me, but I don't really see any evidence of it. Yeah. And they begin to give up on God. The truth of the matter is, if you read through scripture from beginning to end, you yeah. see that God has been there all along, even in the silent periods. Let's say the period between the Testaments at 400 years. Right. right? And God was still there. He was actively at work. He knew exactly mm -hmm. what he was going to do. He knew exactly when he was going to send Jesus as a baby and how that was going to be the hope of Israel. Okay. Uh, yeah. but so for us to assume that he's not doing anything when we pray because things aren't happening, you know, in our realm, that is where our faith, where when James one talks about faith, yeah. that our faith, we have, oh Lord, I don't have that kind of faith. Help me to believe yeah. what you have really said that it is truth. And my feelings or my discouragement um, is not truth, not to believe that, not that it's not bad. Uh, like you said, I never want to minimize the hardship that yeah. women go through. I mean, it, it's very real. It's very difficult. And you can get very bogged down in it. Yes. But God's re word is more real. It's more truth. And that's why we need to get down into the word of God and we need to believe him. And um, that's where our hope is going to begin right there. Yeah. And, and before we get to some specific solutions, uh, ladies, feel free to drop any questions or comments in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them as time permits. But I want to make sure that we distinguish between the two because I could see there could be a lady out there who's being abused. You know what I mean? There could be someone that's really having some struggles that are immoral and illegal. You know what I mean? Yes, I don't yes. think that's what we're speaking about. I think that you should go back to your church, go back to your pastor, go back to the authorities if it is an illegal situation and always get to safety. If that is a situation, we always say, let's get to safety and then we'll deal with it from there. Yeah, you know, absolutely. yes. Let's, let's yeah. not have the children in danger and you in danger. Let's let's let's, but let's do it in a biblical way now. Right, 
Right. You know, let's get, let's get some pastors and elders and things involved. Um, but I do think there's still hope, as you said. So I want to walk down some of the things that you brought up. What can a wife do that is truly bogged down with a husband that refuses to stop sinning? Well, I think that um, for one thing, we need to pr- we need to pray in a certain way about this. Okay, the attitude that we come to the Lord in prayer needs to be a humble attitude. But we need there's no reason why we can't ask God over and over and over again to to help our husband to be a godly husband. Doesn't we don't even have to try to tell God what to do by saying specific things, but to ask the Lord that he will intervene because we know he can and we cannot do that. I think uh, I think about. the things that we'd like our husband to be, we'd love like him to be a, pe- a person of, of love and, mm-hmm. and, and gentleness and self-control. And we often as women kind of try to encourage him to be that way by saying things, doing little things that we think will encourage him. But honestly, if we're really going to trust God and our faith is really in God, then we know those things in his life are the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Yeah. That doesn't mean we shouldn't um, encourage godliness, you know, by our actions and our gentle speech and stuff, but we can't change him. No. But the spirit of God can. And yeah. when we start to believe all that God has said in his word, that it is his spirit that works in us. And then we start praying that way. The Lord, um, I don't know what the Lord's going to do with that prayer. But I know that he's honored when we step back and stop trying to manipulate things. Yes. And we really pray and trust the Lord uh, and then pray that God will grow us up in him so that we have the strength and stamina to continue to deal with whatever we're dealing with in the marriage. So Yeah. And, and, and I think as we pray, we have to remind ourselves that God is still working on us. Yes. It took him time to mature us to whatever point that we are. Yes. It, it was t- it took time. I mean, the same way that we wanted others to be patient and wait on us is the same way that we pray him through. We pray him through the situation. And and now I'm not saying that you don't get with your pastor and talk about different solutions depending on what the sin issue is. You know, if he's gambling and spending all the money in the house and so on and so forth, you may have to call someone in. But even in that, you shouldn't look down and say, oh, well, I would never gamble all the money away. You know, seriously. seriously. Yeah, that's where pride has a big thing. And it's like you said earlier, when we so minimize our own little sins, they're so little and we maximize it. It can it can swell our heads that, that we we do say things like that. Well, I would never do that. I, I would never do that to our family, you know, that type of thing. And And the Lord does not honor people that have that kind of an attitude. So. Yeah. So when we come to the Lord, we need we do need to come humbly and say, Lord, I I have sinned against my husband in ways I probably am not even aware of. Yes. Um, and, and but I, I want to just pray that you will unite us and into people who want to be godly and and that you'll work in both of us. But, you know, that Matthew seven, one through five, which talks mm-hmm. about, you know, uh, take the log out of your own eye because mm-hmm. you might be to take the speck out of your brother's eye mm-hmm. and look at yourself first. And uh, mm-hmm. make sure that that you're working on godliness in your own life for sure. I mean, yes. the Lord's really trying to grow us when He puts us through trials, so Amen. we must we must need it. I believe yeah. so. I know. I do. Yeah, seriously. I know I do. Yeah. You know, year after year, time after time, it never fails. Every year, there's a couple that we counsel where the husband has committed adultery and he has confessed to God and repented to God and he has confessed and repented to his wife and she agrees to stay with him. Um, But, you know, six months later, she's still talking about it. A year later, she's still bringing it up. He can be late for dinner and she's bringing it up. You know, can we talk just a little bit about what true forgiveness looks like? Well, I only have one answer to that. And that is true forgiveness looks like Jesus forgiveness of us. Mm. Okay, So when you're looking at the uh, Ephesians 432, 
Mm -hmm. it, it says that, and when you're looking in Colossians, where it also talks about that, Colossians, I think uh, it's probably 3.14, which talks about forgiveness as well. That's exactly what those two passages are saying, that in the same way that mm -hmm. Jesus forgave us, that is the way that we are to forgive others. Well, how, then the question is, how did Jesus forgive us? Exactly. Well, yeah, we're, he does not throw things back at us. He does not say, oh, you sinned again. Now I'm going to bring that up to the father and I'm going to accuse you before the father. That's not how Jesus forgave us. Right. So we, we must hard as it is. And we have to learn how to do this because it's not mm -hmm. natural to us, yeah. but we have to ask the Lord to teach us how to forgive in the way that he forgave. You know, a lot of women say, well, you know, my husband did some really bad things. Okay. So maybe, maybe it was unfair. Okay. So my husband had an affair and I am going to forgive him, but it's going to take me a really long time. You ever heard that before? Yeah. Okay. Or, they say, or they say, I'll forgive him, but I'll never forget. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, the thing is, is that, is that the way Jesus said, I'll forgive you? Well, you've been a really bad sinner and I'm going to forgive you, but it's going to take me a really long time. Is that the kind of forgiveness we received? Yeah. No, it's not. Uh, and, and I think the answer to the, um, the objection that people say, well, I'm going to forgive him, but I'm never going to forget. I, I think that answer is found in Jeremiah chapter 31. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Verses 31 through 34. All right. Mm -hmm. Where Jesus says, I, or not Jesus, God is talking to Israel, but he is saying, when I bring the new covenant, all right, when I bring the new covenant, which comes with forgiveness, all right, mm -hmm. because, because the blood of the sacrifices never brought forgiveness, not the blood, okay, mm -hmm. it was the blood of Jesus that brings forgiveness. And when I bring that new covenant, I will remember your sins no more. That means I will not remember them against you. Now, does that mean that God forgets? God doesn't forget, okay, his, his, his mind, you know, he, he talks about sins that people commit that he has forgiven right there in the Bible. So it's not to say that he doesn't know they happened type of forgetting. What it says is that he promises not to hold them against us, not to remember them against us. That's what the forgetting is about. Yeah. So that's like when you promise to forgive your husband, you promise not to remember it, not to hold it against, not to keep bringing it up and throwing it back in his face, or you haven't forgiven like God forgives. So that's that's the, the model that we have to follow is how God forgave us. Yes. Right. And now we're talking about true repentance. You know, we're talking about when a spouse has truly repented. And also, I don't think what I'm trying to communicate or what we're communicating is that there aren't consequences. So, you know, you sometimes there are spouses that, you know, uh, like I heard of a man the other day who was constantly with prostitutes and he's a husband. He's constantly, you know, taking on these prostitutes. Now, I'm not saying she shouldn't go to the doctor and get herself checked and so on, you know, preventive measures. Yes. That's not what we're saying when we say you need to forgive him. Exactly. You know, I think people try to make it extremes. We're talking about true repentance where you all are seeking godly help and trying to follow the Lord. And so then you go to your pastor or your elders and you ask them to help guide you down that road because it may look different for someone who's been in that extreme situation yes. to someone whose husband has been on drugs or to for someone whose husband has beat the children. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's yeah. all kinds of scenarios for sin. Yes, but exactly. Yeah. A lot of times what I see, and I don't know about you all, but what I see is it's back to that preference. Uh, he just didn't come in on time or he just, you know, didn't bring the right bread at home or, mm -hmm. you know, so we're back to identifying both of them. Now, before we close, I want to just get to the one another ring that you mentioned. Uh, Yes. Yeah, I think that a lot of people get confused about what not and what do I do? Okay, so let's say your husband has sinned against you. You want to know, well, how do I, how do I treat him? You know, yeah. because my heart wants to treat him like you're you're the sum of the earth. How could you do such a thing? Okay, that's what my heart wants to do. All right, right. but right. I know that's not what I've been called to do as a believer. Yeah. Okay, but how do I put? Uh, you know, how, how do I really figure out how to treat him then? And, and the Bible helps us with that. Mm -hmm. And the passage that you started reading at the mm -hmm. beginning, Romans 1, if mm -hmm. you start at uh, 
I'm sorry, Romans 12. You started reading at verse 1. Uh, but if you start reading at um, verse 12, so we're talking about Romans 12, mm -hmm. and starting in verse 9. I, I know I'm not saying this right. Romans 12, verse 9. Okay. Um, okay, so if you start reading down through there, it gives you, it gives you like a pattern. It gives you uh, categories of which uh, how you're going to know how to treat him. Um, and the first one there, Romans 9 says, my, my ver uh, version says, let love be without hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that actually the word love in there is a command. It's not mm -hmm. a, well, uh, if you're going to love somebody, make sure it's not without hypocrisy. No, it's really saying love one another without hypocrisy. Yes. In other words, don't do it in such a way that um, that your heart is not right and your heart is not in it. And the second thing right after that that follows is that you must hate what is evil. So if you have evil intentions and you're going to try to say, oh, look at me, I'm loving, or uh, I'm going to love him into some uh, whatever, the change, yeah. or yeah. the, whatever, yeah. no. You've just got to say without hypocrisy and abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And then after that, number one, be devoted to one another. You mm -hmm. can be devoted to your husband, even when he's still sinning against you. I think about the category of pornography, which is so yeah. captivating. Okay. And that's a real hard one because it's in the mind. Yes. You know, when, when you're talking about an affair that someone's had, well, they can stop seeing the person. They can stop texting the person. You know, they can stop that relationship. But and, and maybe they're still thinking about them in their mind. I don't know. But as, as far as pornography goes, that's yeah. such a mind thing. And it yeah. controls you. OK. Mm -hmm. um, but you can still devote yourself as a wife and say, I know this is hard for you. I know this is affecting our relationship, but I want to let you know that I'm for you. I'm going to devote myself to yeah. you, whatever, you know, I can do for you to bless you. I want to do that. I yeah. can be devoted to you in love. And you see how something like this can apply to anything. Okay. Yeah. You've gambled our money away. Well, I'm still devoted to you. I'm still your wife. I yeah. still want you to be my husband. How can I love you? And how can I help you so we can have a plan to work through this to kind of get our finances back together? Instead of saying, you, had, you made the problem, man. You fix it. Yep, you're yeah. right. Mm -hmm. You made your bed, you lay in it. Exactly. So, <laughs> so God gives a prescription right down through here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it says not lagging behind a diligence. In other words, don't just say, oh, I'm just going to do the minimum here. No, you pour yeah. yourself into this. Pour yourself into loving your husband or whoever it is that has offended you. Uh, do it in such a way that you are doing it as service to the Lord. That's at the end mm -hmm. of verse 11. Mm -hmm. um, Rejoicing in hope. What what hope? Uh, the hope that God really is with us. His spirit is in us. His spirit is in our husband to yeah. work, to change him, to sanctify him. We have hope in that. Yeah. Those things are true. So that's the way I'm, I'm talking about using a passage of scripture of the one and others can really help help a woman in this kind of situation. Yeah, and and I wanted you to keep going all the way to verse okay. fourteen. Uh, bless those who persecute you. Bless yes. and do not curse. I think there are so many ways we could define curse there because it could be telling his sin issues to the world because yes. you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. You yeah. know, it could be telling the children. You know, it could be. Uh, slandering him on social media. There are so many ways that whole curse could be um, mm -hmm. could be taken, even in terms of your tongue. You know, just yeah. treating him poorly, speaking words that don't edify because you have deemed him unworthy of that. Yes. Because of issues. Or if you do say something nice, you say it in a tone of voice where he knows you don't mean it. Right. So, tone of voice too is still, and and then trying to come up with constructive ways to bless him. Yeah. And that's, to me, you know, that's one of the hardest things. That's the last thing someone wants to do when someone has heaped all kind of abuse upon them, whether it's yeah. having an affair or getting stuck in pornography or gambling away all the money or whatever he's done. Okay. To her, uh, or even been abusive to her yeah. to, to bless someone, to, to give a blessing. Is is and to do something for that other person's benefit, even if I never get anything back in return. That's hard, but that's exactly that's the 
uh, that's what God wants us to do. But he also knows that's not going to happen if we're still sitting on our little high horse saying, I would never do this. How yeah. could you? You've got to have that humble heart, that humble heart that first Peter five talks about. Yeah. That is of great worth in God's sight uh, that he doesn't honor the proud. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but he gives grace. He'll give us grace if we're humble to be able to, uh, to return a blessing like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Amen. That is so true. And ladies, I, I could see where someone's sitting there going, but you don't know my husband and you don't know my situation and this, that, and the other. And again, I want to make sure that no one walks away thinking that we're dismissing um, pain or sin or, and we're certainly not excusing uh, immoral or illegal behavior saying, you know, oh, it's okay just to let them do that. Just, you know, that's, that's not what we're communicating. Counseling to me is always talking to the person that's sitting in your seat you know, sitting in their seat. Like we, we don't know the husband's issues. We, we can't hear his motives. So I always tell ladies, all I can do is encourage you to love the Lord and love your husband and work through it. I mean, he's not sitting here. All I can do is tell you, you you're not obligated to repay evil for evil. The Bible calls us leave room for the wrath of God. It, it, even if that's all that you can do today, <laughs> you just say, I'm not going to get you because I know the Lord will. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's the best you can come up with, but it's just, it is not ladies. <laughs> but if that's just where you are, just, just know that God is seeing everything. He knows everything about you. Nothing gets past him. And yeah. remember, he gave us um, people to walk with us. Yeah. We are not um, only child Christians. Yeah. This is why I think the church environment is so very important. Yes. And make sure that if you're sharing your difficulty with, say, a friend at church, make sure it, that person is going to tell you what the word of God says and not just say, oh, I understand. You just need to find some way to get back at him, even if it's just something little. The Lord understands how, you know, no, no. just make sure that the counsel you're getting from your friends uh, is going to be that which is going to point you to what the, what the word of God says. Yeah. Um, and, and I always uh, tell ladies, be careful of the one, you know, that sister, that single sister that's saying to you, oh, girl, just leave him. Just leave him. Because I'm saying, but she don't have a husband. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you might want to be careful of the one that's rushing you to get rid of yours. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's so true. Well, ladies, oh I thank y'all for joining us. And thank you, Mrs. Janie Street. It has been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's just wonderful to see you. I mean, we can't see each other in person, but I love this. So thank, thank you. you so much. I appreciate it. I would like to leave them with one verse that kind of wraps it up. What What would you think it would be? Hmm. Um, I, I kind of like this Romans 12 kind of at the end. Yeah, I was looking down there too. Mm-hmm. I think maybe if we start with verse 17 uh, and just kind of wrap it up, uh, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, see, this is the one. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Yeah. Ladies, we leave you with that. As much as it depends on you, you can't fix your husband. You can't make him do right. You can't make him behave. He's not three years old. Don't matter how many scriptures you leave on his pillow or, or even how many times you tell him he shouldn't do something. Yeah. Just remember this. As much as it depends on you, be at peace. And I'm going to say in your own house. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen, and ladies, we love you. And this has been Real Life Conversations. And I pray to see you next week, Thursday. We'll have another amazing guest for you. See you soon.